Lizzie. Um, I'm sure many of you will know Lizzie already, but Lizzie is course tutor in sleep medicine at the University of Oxford. I'll let you read her bio for yourselves, um, but it's, it's impressive. Uh, Lizzie has covered many things in sleep, education, research and clinical, both in adults and children. And she often seems to do it all at the same time. I really don't know how she does it. I've worked her, with her for several years in the um, uh, British Sleep Society, and I've also been impressed by her boundless energy and enthusiasm for all things sleep. So without any further delay, I'll hand you over to Lizzie to talk about the brain changes in sleep apnea study. Lizzie. Well, thank you, Tim, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Jörg and the organizers for having me along to speak to you today. Um, I will be speaking about the brain changes in sleep apnea study, which I have spoken about at BSS meetings in the past. I had hoped that we would have final data for you by now, but of course, COVID's put paid to that as it has done for many other research studies. But hopefully today I can give you a flavour of the, the study and some of our preliminary results. So I'll give a very brief introduction to cerebral small vessel disease and obstructive sleep apnea. And then I'll focus on the study itself. So looking at the, um, the underlying premise of the study, our methodology and some very preliminary results, and then just follow up with the next steps. And hopefully there will be time for questions at the end. So firstly, just a very brief introduction to cerebral small vessel disease. So small vessel disease is implicated in a fifth of all strokes and almost half of all cases of dementia of all causes. And it can present in a number of different ways. That could be problems with gait and balance. It could be depression or um, cognitive impairment, but quite often it can be uh, silent. And importantly for us, um, there's no um, specific treatment at present. So diagnosis of small vessel disease is made using neuroimaging. And there are a number of different presentations that we can see on MRI. So we have, for example, here, white matter hyperintensities, which you can see as the white uh, patches here. We have lacoons or small holes in the brain parenchyma, which we can see here. We have enlarged perivascular spaces, which are the focus of the, the study that we're looking at today. And we can also have small bleeds in the brain that can be visualized on MRI. And there are published international guidelines which aim to standardize reporting of these vascular changes on neuroimaging. And although the underlying mechanisms are not fully yet understood, we do know that there are some pathways implicated. So endothelial damage and inflammation can impact on uh, glymphatic drainage of the brain and stiffening and occlusion of the blood vessels can follow on from that. And I would like you to just keep this in mind as we move on to discuss obstructive sleep apnea. So I guess for the, the audience today, we don't need a huge introduction to OSA. We've had a lot of that already today. Um, but as you'll be aware, it's a repetitive cycle of airway collapse and recovery during sleep. And as you can see from the scheme on the right here, um, intermittent hypoxia and autonomic arousals uh, result from obstructive sleep apnea that can in turn lead to sympathetic activation and sleep fragmentation, which cause cardiovascular and neurocognitive um, sequelae. And we also know from work in animal models by the Nadergaard group and others, and also in more recent evidence from human studies, that um, the sleep fragmentation can also impact on glymphatic clearance. So sleep fragmentation can impact on slow wave sleep where glymphatic clearance is upregulated during sleep. So um, if, if you think about this in the context of the previous slide, there's significant overlap between the risk factors for cerebral small vessel disease and untreated obstructive sleep apnea. So it's unsurprising maybe that there are now a number of studies linking obstructive sleep apnea and small vessel disease. And we have two um, very recent meta-analyses here which suggest that there are links between moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea and markers of small vessel disease. However, these include a very small number of publications and these are mainly cross-sectional in nature. And there's some significant variation in both the MRI parameters that are recorded and reported, and also in the diagnostic criteria that are used for small vessel disease and also for OSA. So it's clear that there's a gap in the literature where we um, could do with some prospective studies to address some of the limitations in our knowledge. And that kind of brings us on to the, the study that we'll discuss today. And hopefully at this point, the American spelling of apnea will become apparent. So 
the study that I'm discussing today is part of a portfolio of studies that's been undertaken as part of a transatlantic network funded by the Fondation Le Duc. And as you can see from the map here, this includes a number of sites across Europe and North America who are all working on studies related to the perivascular spaces in small vessel disease. And there are a number of studies ongoing, ranging from basic research to clinical research, um, tying together all the different aspects of the perivascular spaces in small vessel disease. And um, we've been very lucky to be involved in this really productive and exciting project. So the aims of this specific study are to examine the relationship between sleep disturbances and small vessel disease features as visualized on MRI, and to examine the relationship between the changes on MRI and sleep architecture, cognitive function, blood pressure and endothelial function. And we hypothesized that um, treatment of obstructive sleep apnea might impact on the changes that we see on the MRI, and so we're conducting all of these measures before and after four months of CPAP therapy. So um, a bit more about our methodology, we've recruited symptomatic adult sleep clinic patients with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea with significant uh, desaturations. So we've used a cutoff, an apnea hypopnea index cutoff of 15 and an ODI cutoff of 10 for this study. Um, all participants, of course, need to be suitable for MRI and all our patients are either subjectively sleepy using the Epworth sleepiness scale or otherwise have clinical symptoms of excessive daytime somnolence. Our sample size was projected at 80 patients, which were split across two sites, 40 in Edinburgh and 40 in Toronto. And our partners in Toronto are at Sunnybrook, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre, and the team there is led by Sandra Black, Andrew Lim, Brad McIntosh and Joe Ramirez. And all of this work has been done in conjunction with the team at Sunnybrook. So this is an overview of the um, study protocol, and you can see that we have our two sets of measures at baseline and at four months. And each of the sets of measures last, lasted approximately a week. So we initially had a battery of cognitive tests, which were conducted at the start of the week. We then had a, a week of ambulatory monitoring, which includes 24 hour blood pressure monitoring for the first 24 hours. We included seven days of actigraphy, we also included sleep studies on one night using the WatchPat device. And as a validation of the WatchPat, we also undertook concurrent PSG in a subset of patients in the Edinburgh cohort only. After that week of um, measurements, the participants came back to the clinic, at which point they had their battery of MRI. They had um, blood and urine uh, samples taken for biomarkers as well. And it was at this point that the patients would commence on auto CPAP with telemonitoring for the next four months. And they could follow up with us um, during that time. After four months, we had all the participants back for the same procedure. So the cognitive evaluation on the first day, seven days of ambulatory monitoring, and then a repeat of the MRI and the um, biomarkers. And the MRI protocol in total took about two and a half hours. So it's a long time to be in the scanner. And on top of all the other um, measures that we were taking, it was quite burdensome for the patients, but they seemed to adhere to it quite well and were quite happy to participate in the study, which was great. So in terms of the MRI acquisition and the MRI protocols, um, all the image acquisition and analysis was conducted using previously published methods, which I've list listed here, which have been developed between the Edinburgh and Toronto um, groups, at, as well as others. And all the scans were um, collected using a three Tesla Siemens Prisma MRI scanner. And we had a number of different sequences which were run over the two and a half hours of the test. We had structural scans but using T1 weighted, T2 weighted flare and proton density. We used diffusion tensor imaging. We had some MR spectroscopy. We had cerebral vascular reactivity, um, which was derived using um, inhalation of uh, enhanced CO2. And we also had some contrast enhanced MRI as well. So a fairly comprehensive battery of MRI scans um, were used. In addition to the brain scans, we also did some retinal imaging to visualize the small uh, blood vessels in the back of the eye uh, using optical coherence tomography, which I haven't presented here. In terms of the data that's presented today, it was all very standard statistical analysis using SPSS version 27. The descriptive data are presented as either a mean and plus or minus standard deviation or a median with interquartile range. And the associations between sleep and the MRI outcomes were explored, explored using multiple linear regression modeling. 
Okay, so over the next few slides, I'll share some preliminary data from the study and it should be, um, I, I would like to just highlight that this is very preliminary and that the study is very much ongoing. So recruit, recruitment was completed in Edinburgh in December 2019, shortly before I moved over to my new job in Oxford. And um, at that point, we had consented 44 patients and retained 42 of them to follow up. In Toronto, unfortunately, they were impacted significantly by the COVID epidemic. And so um, recruitment is still ongoing. And uh, of course, follow ups have been quite difficult in that context as well. They have had slightly more withdrawals again due to the COVID situation. But everything that I'll present today is a preliminary analysis of patients who have valid processed baseline MR data available at the time of writing, which was up until this morning. Um, and so we have a total cohort of 66 participants, 42 from Edinburgh and 24 from Toronto. So please do bear in mind that these are small numbers and as such, studies not uh, adequately powered at this stage. So looking at the baseline characteristics for both cohorts, you can see that around two thirds of our participants are male with ages ranging from the early 30s to the late 80s. Of note, the Toronto cohort tend to be older, whereas the cohort in Edinburgh tend to have higher BMIs. But as you can see from the panel on the right, the majority of participants in the study were classed as overweight or obese using the World Health Organization cutoffs, um, with very few falling within the normal BMI category. Looking at these cardiovascular risk factors at baseline, you can see that cardiovascular risk factors are common across both cohorts and were similar across both sites with almost three quarters of participants reporting at least one cardiovascular risk factor. And just under half of our participants, 44% uh, are hypertensive. So this slide summarizes the sleep study data, which is derived from the WatchPat device at baseline. And it's notable that the Toronto cohort have significant, uh, have somewhat less uh, severe sleep apnea and also um, more hypoxia. They're also, as mentioned earlier, less sleepy um, as measured by Edward's sleepiness scale. But we did have that criteria of otherwise showing symptoms of excessive daytime somnolence. And as you can see from the graph here, a small number of participants who met the original entry criterion of moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea in clinic, mostly recorded with uh, PSG or cardiorespiratory polygraphy, um, subsequently showed up as normal or having only mild OSA when we used the watch pad. So I don't have the data here, but we do have a subset of participants in Edinburgh who also had PSG. And I think it'll be interesting to find out if there are any significant differences in terms of this subset of patients. Um, but unfortunately, those data aren't available yet, um, but it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. So looking at the MRI measures, um, I've reported here the white matter hyperintensities, uh, the, the volume of white matter hyperintensities, the ratio of white matter hyperintensity to intracranial volume, so correcting for the, the brain size. And I've also included the enlarged perivascular spaces volume, which is measured in the Centrum Semio Valley. And um, it's interesting to see that there's quite a low um, burden of white matter hyperintensity in both groups, certainly lower than we would see in some of the other cohorts that these groups record, such as stroke patients, for instance. Um, interestingly, the white matter hyperintensity volume is slightly lower in Edinburgh than Toronto, which might reflect the slightly younger population. In terms of the perivascular spaces, these are numerous in both cohorts, um, but it should be noted that in terms of the, um, the PVS measures, we only have 60 participants currently with valid data. And I'll mention something about that in our next steps. So some interesting data to, to get us started, um, but of course, very preliminary. And it's guess, again, I'll watch this space to see what, ha what happens next. So of course, what does all this mean? It's always easier to look at a picture than all those numbers. And this is a 3D image, which is reconstructed from a T2 scan in a single study participant. And what you can hopefully see here is the white matter intensities, which are visualized in blue. And we have the enlarged perivascular spaces, which are visualized in yellow. And I should thank my colleague, Lucia Ballerini, who um, has been involved in writing the, the pipeline for this and also for providing this image. So in terms of the exploratory um, associations at baseline, there weren't any significant associations between AHI, ODI, 
or the nadir of um, oxygen saturation with white matter and hypertense, white matter hyperintensity or PVS volume after we controlled for age, BMI and cardiovascular risk factors. And it actually seemed that age appeared to exert the biggest effect along with cardiovascular risk. However, there are only small numbers of participants here. And so the study is currently underpowered as I've already mentioned. The lower burden of white matter hyperintensities is of note, particularly in Edinburgh where the patients are younger. Um, when we compare this with other studies, many previous studies focus on older patients with higher burdens of small vessel disease. So it could be that our younger participants haven't had time to develop more significant damage, or it may be that, um, that there's, there, there isn't an association and that actually OSA is not directly related, but it's more of a co-association with small vessel disease. Um, but of course, we are at a very early stage and can't make any conclusions around this at the moment. And I think particularly it will be interesting to see if the uh, perivascular space in large, very, in large perivascular spaces change or reduce with effective CPAP treatment. So again, watch this space. So finally, just to finish up with some of the challenges and next steps, the obvious one is COVID. I'm sure this has been the theme today that um, COVID has had a significant impact on many aspects of our practice. And in particular for this study, it's impacted severely on recruitment and retention in Toronto. In Edinburgh, we had some problems with the limits of the scanner. So we had some patients who were just physically too large to fit inside the scanner. So we have only included individuals who had a BMI of, 40, of, of under 45 kilograms per square meter or whose weight was under 180 kilograms. So there is a bit of a, a systematic bias there in that we haven't recruited some of the, the super obese patients. However, we um, managed to recruit our patients and we hope that Toronto will manage to complete re recruitment despite all the setbacks by the end of this year. As I mentioned, there is some work ongoing around the PVS processing. So Lucia and colleagues have been um, working on refining the pipeline for this. And so some of these um, some of these variables will change. And also we hope that we can include a few more patients who had slightly noisy scans once we have some better processing methods. But we are looking forward to analyzing the full set of data before and after CPAP. And we hope to have the full study finished by the end of 2022. So at that point I'll finish. Uh, just to summarize, there is increasing evidence of links between untreated obstructive sleep apnea and small vessel disease. Early diagnosis and treatment of OSA may reduce the risk of small vessel disease, stroke and dementia, and we hypothesize that CPAP might reverse some of the MRI markers of small vessel disease, although further research and the end of our own study is required. So none of this, of course, is a one person effort. We have a huge team both in Edinburgh and Toronto to thank. We have the wider Fondation Leduc network. And if you want to know more about the overall study, um, the overall portfolio of studies, you can visit our website there. Of course, I always have something to plug in now that I'm in Oxford. If you've enjoyed your conference today, if you've been renewed and excited about, about sleep, then if you would like to take your studies further, then we're always um, open to applications and we are accepting applications for this September. So at this point, I really will finish. If you have any questions, you can ask me now. Otherwise, you can direct them to my Oxford email address, which is shown here. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, yeah, I'll take any questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie. Great talk. Um, there isn't much time, I'm afraid. There's, there's one question from Angus Nisbet. Um, you probably can see it yourself there, saying it's more of a comment, really. Enlarged uh, PV spaces correlate more with hypertension than with actual small vessel cerebrovascular disease per se. Do you have anything to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that that is one of the reasons why we include um, hypertension as one of our main um as one of the main areas that we want to control for. So yeah, there is that correlation there. I think it'll be interesting to see um, what else we find once we have the full cohort there. But yes, I, I take that point on board. Thank you. And just a quick question from me. Um, do you think, it's a premature question really, but if you get a negative result uh, and you were asked to do it again, or you had an opportunity to do it again, would you just go for more severe apnea? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, we wanted to, we, we kind of went for the more severe end anyway. That's why we had the criteria in there about desaturation. Um, I, I guess we wanted to have something that was relatively real world. I mean, if we only go for the, the really severe patients, does that really tell us much about the population as a whole? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess you could go for the, you know, cherry pick the much more severe patients. 
I think it's more of a, a wait and see what happens this time around before we make any further conclusions. Great. Well, thanks very much, Lizzie. Sorry, there's no more time to chat about it. Um, but we've got. We're, it's time for the next speaker, um, Michelle Hugh. Prof, um, Professor Michelle Hugh is based at the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences, University of Oxford, and also an honorary consultant at Oxford Un University Hospitals. Uh, again, I'll let you read Michelle's bio for yourselves. Michelle leads the fantastically successful Discovery Parkinson's research program out of Oxford. I've been honoured to help in a very small way uh, by contributing uh, patients diagnosed with REM sleep behaviour disorder um, at Papworth Hospital in Cambridge uh, to the programme. Um, and as I said, it's uh, produced lots of great results um, and Michelle already has a string of publications uh, associated with that. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Michelle. Michelle's going to speak about REM sleep behaviour disorder, a window into prodromal Parkinsonism. Michelle. Many thanks, Tim. Um, just going to hopefully get my PowerPoint open system preferences. Okay. Uh, this should have worked. Okay, share screen. Should I do, let me just see if that's going to work. Desktop one. Am I desktop one? I assume so. Oh, so, sorry, I'm just going to my system preferences. <laughs> Google, Chrome, Zoom. Here we go. Yeah. Um, I can choose to quit. No. Okay, let's do that. Hopefully now I can. Funny how it suddenly started to play up. Right. <laughs> um, screen share. Yeah, try the... Oh, what was that note from Lizzie? <laughs> oh, I've got it now. Yeah, yeah, I'm on. Right, I think it was actually just my preferences that have changed. Can everybody Brilliant. see me and hear me, hopefully? Yes. Perfect, Michelle. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. And thanks for all the audiovisual help. Just going to start my timer. So firstly, many thanks to Tim for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a bit about our experience in prodromal Parkinson's. Um, Basically, this is a relatively new sleep disorder, RBD, that we're talking about. It was diagnosed, as many of you will know, 25 years ago by Carlos Schenk, who is a retired sleep neurologist, but still very research active in Minnesota. And since uh, 1996, this condition uh, really has exploded into the scene of Parkinson's and dementia research. The reason is it's the strongest risk factor for future alpha nucleinopathy, and this is now being recapitulated uh, through various cohort studies of well phenotyped PSG diagnosed RBD patients. So my personal interest in RBD uh, started when I first saw uh, 15 years ago uh, as a consultant, the wife of this patient who um, she was giving, she had dragged him in and uh, he, she was complaining bitterly that she wasn't sleeping because he was shouting and moving and kicking in his sleep. So I diagnosed RBD clinically. At that time, there was a one year sleep waiting list uh, for referral and then another year for the PSG. So we ju I just examined him, neurologically it was fine, um, and I treated him with clonazepam. Story over. Apart from the fact he then came back to me a year later uh, with a six week history of intermittent tremor. So he really hadn't waited long uh, from noticing these symptoms to requesting neurology referral by his GP. It wasn't particularly impacting on daily functioning, but he had some non-motor symptoms and I examined him and he, had, he was clearly fulfilling criteria for early Parkinson's disease. So made the diagnosis. And he was one of our first patients to be recruited into the RBD cohort. Uh, and I followed him up now over six years since his Parkinson's diagnosis. He's behaved very typically like many of our Parkinson patients do with a pretty good response to levodopa. He's needed also some resagiline for wearing off symptoms. He's uh, responded to clonazepam to treat his RBD. However, that's not his current main problem. The main problem he has now is that of poor sleep at night, excessive daytime somnolence and some cognitive impairment now developing. So the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre or OCDC Discovery Cohort 
was something that came out of the direct result really of seeing a patient with RBD and then looking at the literature and seeing what was happening worldwide. This is funded by Parkinson's UK. It was set up in 2010. The PD patients for this cohort are early, they're within three years of diagnosis and they're a community acquired cohort from the Thames Valley population shown here in red on the map, which is about 2.1 million people. And they're recruited for secondary care. We recruited 321 controls who were largely partners of the PD patients and they were age and gender matched as far as possible. And then we started to recruit RBD patients with the help really of sleep clinicians, including Tim Quinnell at the Patworth Hospital, Gary Dennis at the Royal Hallamshire Hospital Sheffield, and Dr. Zenobia Zywala, who subsequently retired and has been replaced by Mikhail Simmons at our home base in the JR. So all of our participants now uh, from the start actually have had in-depth face-to-face monthly, uh, 18 monthly assessments. And each visit takes about two hours. Uh, we're collecting variety of motor and non-motor assessments, including cognitive function. We're doing imaging in a subset and we're doing some biosampling and digital phenotyping in addition. So the Oxford RBD cohort so far, we've recruited 194 uh, PSG diagnosed RBD. We generally exclude RBD patients in whom there's a very clear temporal trigger to their RBD onset with medication. So the majority are uh, not medication induced. And we also are not selective on the basis of age. So we do have patients going back with quite young RBD in their 30s, but the median age is matched exactly actually to our PD patient cohort and it's 66 years. So of, so far we have 34 converters out of the 194 RBD cases and very much in keeping with other cohort studies, we can see here that the, the commonest uh, that they convert to is Parkinson's followed by dementia with Lewy body or otherwise unclassifiable dementias. And then much less commonly, multiple system atrophy or its prodrome, pure autonomic failure. The main point about all of these conditions is, is that they're pathologically alpha synucleinopathies. And I'd just like to pay tribute here to our clinical fellows since 2013, including Mikhail Walinski, uh, Christine Lowe and Tom Barber, who have driven out uh, and set up these cohorts in collaboration with the local sleep consultants. So this is some of the data we collect, um, including demographics. We do a combination of motor assessments, including standardised rating with the Movement Disorder Society, UPDRS or Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. We also do some semi-quantitative motor testing like a three meter timed up and go test, the Purdue pegboard test, um, and the flamingo test, which involves how long a participant can stand on one leg for. You can see here the cognitive testing. We've now moved into web-based cognitive testing as well. And we do uh, a sense of smell uh, using, we assess uh, for hyposmia using the sniffing 16 odor identification. We also look for autonomic dysfunction and we measure sleep with questionnaires, including a modification of the Hong Kong RBD screening questionnaire to look at severity and at worth data on uh, somnolence. We also look at mood uh, and we look at quality of life. And as I said, we have a combination of wet biomarkers. We also do lumbar punctures, skin biopsies for stem cell generation in a subgroup. And then we do DAPSPECT MR imaging as well in a subgroup. So one of the largest studies that we've helped contribute to was led by Ron Postuma, uh, who is very much, uh, I would say, one of the lead uh, authors in RBD uh, publications. And one of his skill sets is to bring together large numbers of RBD cases, which you need for the look, you know, for this sort of um, analysis more in depth of kind of conversion biomarkers. And here he brought together 1,280 PSG confirmed RBD cases, which was a massive feat from 24 RBD uh, centres in the RBD study group, which I'm a part of, and they were followed up over an average of five years. So this study landmark, as it confirmed that the average 
conversion rate per year was 6.3%. So this is by far greater than any known genetic risk factor that we have for prodromal Parkinson's. And this study showed that the main predictors for imminent, i.e. near-term conversion, were the presence of quantitative motor deficits on testing or on an objective motor exam, like with the UPDRS, part three, the presence of olfactory deficit, mild cognitive impairment, and an abnormal DAD scan. Ron has also previously shown that you can risk stratify RBD patients from his Montreal, Montreal cohort. So these have actually been evaluated over a longer period of 10 years. If you just take participants over the age of 55 and you exclude participants in whom RBD is triggered by medication, such as antidepressants, you uh, only include those who are strictly hyposmic and have evidence for motor dysfunction on the scales I've mentioned, uh, you actually increase that annual conversion from 6% to 21% per annum. So we're now starting to look at numbers needed to treat in a future clinical trial scenario. Um, Ron has also had the advantage of having a cohort that's been very well followed up over, up, up over sort of 14 to 16 years for some of these RBD individuals with Jacques Montplaisir. And what he was able to do just by following up these participants longitudinally was to look at what the temporal sequence of uh, non-motor motor uh, features were in these RBD individuals as they progress to phenoconvert. So the key take home message is that hyposmia is present at least 20 years prior to phenoconversion. It's the earliest non-motor feature we know. And we then start to see PSG evidence uh, of prediction. And this includes the percentage of REM sleep without atonia. The higher the percentage, the greater the future uh, conversion risk. Uh, we then start to see around 10 years prior to conversion, uh, a variety of measurable uh, dysfunctions in autonomic bladder, uh, bowel, and color vision. And then just five years prior to phenoconversion, we start to see motor signs for which quantitative assessments are better than qualitative, and we start to see the presence of cognitive dysfunction. So the challenge really in stratifying each individual RBD patient for near-term conversion is that we have in Parkinson's a slowly progressive heterogeneous disease. We have a long prodromal latency of 20 years. We need improved subject selection and stratification for trials. And the range of biomarkers that we need to apply need to cover things like monitoring, pharmacodynamic, and prognostic uh, areas. So a single biomarker is unlikely to achieve this. And if you think about cancer and its successes, it's used a variety of polymodal approaches, which we think to be the best way forward. So how we've approached this in the OPDC RBD cohort is by looking at digital wearables. So each participant that comes to clinic takes part in a 10 minute uh, smartphone app based test of motor function shown here. Uh, we have now shown, uh, well, in particular, Siddhartha Aura and Christine Lowe did the analysis of shown that on the basis of a single smartphone test, we can achieve separation accuracies in the range of 90% in between RBD and control and between RBD and PD subjects. This is based simply on the single smartphone test with none of the demographic data I'm showing you. Christine has then gone on to look at whether we can develop a more quantitative overall measure of motor severity. And she has developed something called a composite motor score, where she has taken existing clinical measures we collect in every participant in the face-to-face -face clinic uh, that can then be predicted by the smartphone test. And what she has shown is that this composite motor score compared to the MDS UPDRS exhibits lower variability relative to the mean, therefore reducing the numbers needed to treat in a, in a future trial arm because there's less variability. She's also shown there's a greater score range, particularly in those more modestly affected with motor dysfunction in the RBDN, so there's less of a floor effect. And lastly, she's been able to show that the composite score has greater ability to track longitudinal change particularly in RBD individuals, and that it might therefore prove to be a powerful biomarker for imminent conversion. 
We've also contributed to a large DAT imaging study published in BRAIN this year, uh, which looked at 344 RBD patient DAT scans compared to 256 controls. And here, because the variables that were clinically collected were limited, they focus, the authors uh, focus mainly on DAT striatal binding ratios, MMSE, constipation, hyposmia, and the motor score with the MDS Jupiter S3. So the best convert, uh, predictor of risk was a combination of putamen asymmetric reduction plus constipation plus an age over 70. And this predicted future Parkinson's conversion with a hazard ratio of around six. Interestingly, participants who had very uh, uh, symmetrical chordate reductions in DAT were more likely, particularly if combined with a lower cognitive estimate on the MMSE, they were more likely to phenoconvert to dementia or DLB compared to PD patients who had higher cognitive function on MMSE, uh, but reduced chordate asymmetry. And PD patients have more putaminal asymmetry, but relatively unaffected chordate. So we're starting to see now biomarkers that may not only predict imminent conversion, but what type of uh, condition or neurodegeneration the participant will go on to convert to. In Oxford, we've also focused on an imaging subgroup of around 150 of our participants, where we've done a variety of MR sequences. So here we've looked at structural T1s, uh, we've looked at the whole brain using diffusion weighted MR, we've done a resting state fMRI, fMRI sequence, and in 2017, we brought in specific sequences to look at nigrosome one. Now, nigrosome one can be shown by something here in the red arrow along the, alongside the healthy control. And you see a small white blob that looks a little bit like the swallowtail. And this is uh, corresponds to nigrosome one, and it's been shown in post-mortem ex vivo imaging to relate to the dopamine producing neurons that project to the posterior putamen. So these are the ones affected earlier on in Parkinson's. And previous studies showed that this is absent uh, in around 96% of people with Parkinson's disease. So we can use susceptibility weighted imaging and we can also use neuromelanin sensitive imaging to focus on the nigra. And Tom Barber, who led this analysis was able to show that if you integrate a variety of different nigral measures, including nigral volume, nigral intensity on neuromelanin, a locus cerealis intensity, as well as the presence or absence of dorsal nigral hyperintensity or swallowtail, and the ROI intensity seen there, that you get good separation between PD and control with AUCs of around 98%, and between control and RBD of around 77%. So it may well be that RBD patients who will go on to convert to PD may have a more PD-like neuromelanin and nigral pattern, and that those who go on to develop dementia with Lewy body will have symmetry in their chordate putamen, uh, in their chordate DAT compared to putaminal asymmetry seen in PD. We're also looking at whether cortical atrophy patterns seen early on in the RBD will predict which uh, of the future neurodegenerative disorders they'll convert to. So just really ending by thinking about designing neuroprotective trials. And I think that these are going to be happening in the next few years for RBD participants, because up to now, most studies have failed in established PD, and we're looking at trialing medication earlier on. So we can actually come up with a reasonably sensible paradigm for stratification shown here, where we clinically stratify in very similar to Ron Postuma. We add in imaging investigations, including DATSPECT, maybe MR, neuromelanin SWI, where we start to look for the presence of misfolded alpha-synuclein in skin and spinal fluid, and maybe combine that with a digital measure to deliver trials that will have an endpoint of uh, reducing future phenoconversion. So just to end by thanking the clinical cohort team, the discovery imaging team, and also all of the sleep clinicians that have really worked with us and been fantastic collaborators to make this study a success. Thank you.
happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, any questions from the, the group? I'm not seeing anything in the, the chat. So um, if I could maybe start, you, you mentioned about the, the different phenotypes um, and some of the different biomarkers that then go on to convert to different alpha synucleinopathies. Are there any differences in those different groups on PSG? Or is it really only when you move on to the, the scanning and so on? That's a really interesting question. So we have um, studies by um, Eric St. Louis, who is working with Bradley Bove in the US in the Mayo Clinic, has actually shown that the percentage of REM sleep without atonia is a, a driving biomarker for future phenoconversion. But that in itself doesn't appear to separate out individual risk or comparative risk versus, say, PD versus DLB. However, that study was only published about a year ago. And my suspicion is that if you start to look in greater detail at the PSG, not just things like the percentage of REM sleep without atonia, but other features, that there will start to emerge um, things that will predict, you know, which alpha synuclein will be converted to. So, you know, one of the things that we want to do here that we haven't had time to do up to now is actually retrieve the PSG data for all of the 200 uh, RBD and then start to look at it for uh, PSG biomarkers. Okay, interesting. Thank you. We've got one other question here that's come in from the group from Teresa Bainan. Um, are there currently treatments available for Parkinson's that are beneficial if it's diagnosed earlier? Yeah, so this comes back to the fact that uh, around 23 billion US dollars have so far been wasted in negative trials for neuroprotective treatments for Parkinson's. The only exception so far that I'm aware of is exercise. And exercise has been shown both in animal models of the disease and in some human studies to slow down motor progression in PD and also to protect against future dementia. So for me, um, I tell all my newly diagnosed PD patients they need to exercise. I say the same to RBD and I will be applying for funding to do potentially a randomized exercise intervention trial in RBD. Fantastic. Um, we, I, we're going to have to move on at this point. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Hugh, for your fantastic presentation. Hopefully you can stick around in case there are any further yes. questions. Um, and hopefully when I eventually get to come back down to Oxford, I can pay you a visit at some point. Lovely. Um, at this point, we'll move on. So our next speaker is Professor Dieter Riemann, who's a professor of clinical psychophysiology at the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy at Freiburg University Medical Center. He's also a visiting professor at the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute in Oxford, and he's also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Sleep Research. And today, Professor Riemann will talk to us on REM sleep instability and insomnia. So, Dieter, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Lizzie, thank you very much for introducing me. I hope you see me well and hear me well and you see my talk. I'm Perfect. happy to be here. Happy to be with you. And uh, also hello to Jörg, uh, who invited me. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to use the next 15 minutes to talk about REM sleep instability in uh, insomnia. Uh, so there are four, four topics I have on my agenda. I'll briefly talk about insomnia and hyperarousal. I'll switch to REM sleep. I talk to insomnia and REM sleep instability. And I'll talk about a series of studies we performed uh, over the last years. Uh, to give you a good impression of insomnia, I always like to show this brief sequence from a documentary film. This is a film made by Alan Berlin, an American um, filmmaker, director, and he has insomnia himself in a chronic way. And he, he just, uh, he talks about it and says he's obsessed with it. And I just show you this brief sequence so you get an impression what it feels Insomnia. Ah, do you hear it? Uh, I think I want to. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I think I have to. Um, there should be an option that says share sound. Yes, exactly. The sound. That's it. I found it. So, and I have to. Yes. So we have to go back and we need to go to the. In here. Yes. You hear it now? Yes, yes we should. Can hear it. Yep. The baby's coming in two months. I've never changed a diaper in my life. 
Do I watch the birth or film the birth? Shooting it would be better for the film, but how can I watch the birth of my child through a lens? Just relax. I'm too tired to relax. I'm gonna be a zombie tomorrow. I feel like a zombie right now. What was I saying? What if he wants to be an economist like Shari? What if he becomes a doctor? That would be okay. He could get me the latest sleeping pills. Stop it, stop it, just relax. He's not even born yet. He's gotta go to nursery school first. That reminds me, we have to get the applications early. New York City nursery schools are really competitive. Yeah. I think you get the message. Uh, and, I mean, I, I experienced something like that too, maybe once in a month, once every three months, and probably all familiar with the kind of state. But if you go through this every night, it really, it's probably, it's a bit like torture. And that's what many people tell us about their racing thoughts and about their inability uh, to stop these racing thoughts. And uh, we think, um, the insomnia, people with insomnia frequently complain about hours of not being able to sleep, about sleeping three or four hours. And uh, there's a huge gap here to the polysomnographic literature because most of the studies show that people with insomnia usually, they get their six, six and a half hours. It's less than normal sleep, but it doesn't really correspond to the subjective complaint of people. And we and many others think that this has something to do with the microstructure of sleep. So what we have here is a good sleeper and a poor sleeper and insomniac patients. And what we have here is the frequency spectra of uh, the sleep EEG. And what we and others have shown is that there's an increase of the fast frequencies during sleep. And there's also an alteration of the microstructure you see the overall structure of sleep is quite intact, but what we really see is sleep is more fragmented and we have lots more micro arousals and especially these micro arousals during REM sleep are increased. And I come to this later on. And we think that this might explain the complaint uh, of uh, people with insomnia. If we take the whole hyperarousal hypothesis together, there's a lots of evidence for it. Uh, we have alterations in autonomic function, increased heart rate, altered heart rate variability. We have an increased cortisol output, and especially at the area. If you look at the brain, we find these uh, this increase of fast frequencies in the EEGs, and also an increased number of arousals, which led us to the postulate of. Uh, uh, sleep instability in that. If you look at um, the imaging studies which were done in insomnia, and these were mostly done during the day, not during the night, because it's really a huge challenge to study sleep, not only in good sleepers, but also in people with insomnia, either with the fMRI or with PET. So there are only a very, very few studies, but most of the studies have been done during the day. And we summarized that in 2015, that most of the studies at the time done with uh, fMRI, with SPECT, with PET, indicated that in people with insomnia compared to good sleepers, we find a kind of cortilimbic, corticolimbic overactivity interfering with sleep promoting structures. And to put this in a very, I would say, trivial form, well, we suggested that uh, there's some kind of people with insomnia don't sleep as homogeneous as healthy sleepers brain do. Let's make a switch here to REM sleep. This is taken from the uh, um, from uh, sleep lab data, from our data, and we all know the characteristics, the rapid eye movement, the low voltage EEG, muscle atonia, and we heard a lot about that in a previous talk, and the relevance for, for REM sleep behavior disorder. We know that <clears throat> REM sleep is a highly active brain state, in some cases even more active than the waking brain. This is data from, I think, I guess, which was the first PET study looking at um, REM sleep. And what was shown here is this increased activity, glucose uh, metabolism in the pons, in the amygdala, in the thalamus, up to the cortex. So REM sleep, uh, in fact, is probably the most highly active uh, brain state uh, during sleep. And it might be especially prone to arousals or to micro arousals if you already suffer from some kind of hyperarousal. REM sleep 
has also been strongly related to emotional brain function. This is the famous Matthew Walker paper from 2014. And he suggested a role for REM sleep for emotional brain function. This, this would be here, the, the four or five consecutive REM pre periods of a night. And he postulated that based upon the fact that the noradrenergic system, locus cerulis, is silent during REM sleep, this might, REM sleep might serve a kind of desensitizing effect concerning emotions. So uh, you would, we probably we would forget our emotions during REM sleep. Now, that's a very attractive theory, but one has to say there's also not only evidence in favor, of it, there's also evidence really not favoring this theory, but it's uh, an attractive theory, and it could also explain why insomniacs experience their nightlife so negative. If you ask them of, about their rumination, etc., uh, nobody ever says, I'm happy lying awake, I'm happy room about ruminating, but they're all very unhappy about it, or mostly it's toned with negative emotions. So why insomnia and REM sleep instability? I think till 10 years ago, nobody ever cared about REM sleep when talking about insomnia. This is a study we published in 2008. This is the misperception of sleep. So what we compared here is subjectively measured total sleep time. So via sleep questionnaire, sleep diaries versus polysomnography defined total sleep time. There's not such a huge difference between the subjective, the objective level versus the much higher uh, um, frequency of misperception of sleep both ways. And you see here, these are the insomnia subjects claiming that in comparison to the polysomnography, they slept three or two hours less subjectively than in comparison to the polysomnography. What happens if we take this measure of misperception and correlated with sleep stages. It didn't correlate with stage wake, but the only correlation we found is with REM sleep. So people who had more REM sleep in this column, in this uh, sample, were those having a stronger misperception. And interestingly, we also looked at the frequency at arousals during non-REM sleep and REM sleep. The micro found a far higher rate of micro arousals during REM sleep. So we, we suggested at that time, maybe this perception of sleep, which is not so much related to the general structure, is altered by REM sleep or the impression not sleeping so much is due to the fact that people are, have frequent, frequent arousals, micro arousals out of REM sleep and thereby don't perceive the REM sleep as sleeping, but as being awake and ruminating. And, and this is now very, put this very simply, our uh, insomnia theory saying uh, sleep is instable, more instable hybrid or especially REM sleep is much more uh, instable in people with insomnia compared uh, to good sleepers. Just to uh, finish this up, I'd just briefly like to present two studies we performed in that direction. The first one is already published in sleep two years ago. And here we looked at 27 people with insomnia, 27 good sleepers, and we woke them out of non-REM sleep three times, non-REM sleep stage two, and we woke them out of REM sleep. And we looked at arousal thresholds, awakening thresholds, the latency to till people woke up. And we looked at mentation and we asked people, when you heard the tone, which were you awoken, were you awake or were you in sleep? This is uh, uh, the main difference we found here. Uh, the main result from this study, this is stage two awakenings. This is REM sleep awakening. And the judgment significantly different only for REM sleep. People with insomnia more frequently indicated they were awake. And if they had indicated they were asleep, most of the time people with insomnia were far less secure they were asleep. So people with insomnia indicated as was our hypothesis when they were woken out of REM sleep, not having slept, but having been awake. And interestingly also the frequency of negative emotions was increased, especially around the 
REM sleep, not out of stage two sleep. So some initial confirmation of our idea that um, people with insomnia experience sleep, especially REM sleep different. If you wake them up, they more frequently indicate, I, I didn't sleep at all, I was awake. And that would nicely fit with the idea that REM sleep per se, as a brain state is nearer to the wake state than other sleep states. So we went on to a next study. And what we did here is uh, we thought we should increase the number of uh, awakenings we have, uh, but you can't do this by awakening. But what we did here is we used uh, event-related potentials. We played to each of our subjects in this study more than 10,000 stimuli at a very uh, low uh, acoustic intensity. These were guitar tones and we played them every one and a half seconds. They were randomized and these were just four different guitar tones and all uh, guitar tones and all people could sleep quite uh, okay with this. What we did is we had 50 patients with insomnia here and we had 50 good sleepers. We had them in the sleep lab for four nights and we did two recordings with the ERPs in night three and four because we thought it might be good to have a kind of ability uh, here. And so this looks is, for example, an insomnia patient during the stimulation night. And altogether, we played 15,000 tones. And uh, what we wanted to have was a huge sample of events. And you see here that we have lots of tones during wake, but also during non-REM stage or during REM stage. So what we found here, and these are data now which have just been submitted to the Journal of Sleep is, these are the grand averages from the event-related potentials, 50 good sleepers versus 50 people with insomnia. And here we have the typical waveforms, the, the positive waves, the negative waves, P1, N1, P2. And here are the different sleep stages. And, uh, and naturally the wake state is very different from sleep states. And um, the main effect we found is that the, the positive, the P2 wave, the positive uh, uh, wave after 200 milliseconds was especially altered in phasic REM sleep. And if we had a closer look at group differences here, it turned out that the reduced P2 amplitudes were identified in insomnia disorder relative to good sleepers, specifically in phasic REM sleep. That was the main result we found. And we could show a frontal negativity to contribute most to this group difference. So we think that this might reflect a kind of difference, a very fine grained subtle difference between good sleepers and people with insomnia as a kind of mismatch, increased mismatch negativity, uh, reflecting changes in the automatic detection of uh, uh, what's happening in the auditory system and a concomitant orienting response. So people with insomnia, especially during phasic REM sleep, uh, show a different uh, response to acoustic stimuli, which then might also explain an altered perception of sleep. And that's, uh, I'd like to end with a final slide. This is some kind of theory we put up about our insomnia theory. And we think uh, um, that the arousal is an important factor. It might be especially uh, um, perception or the detection or the processing Stimuli during REM sleep, especially during phasic REM sleep, which might explain the altered perception of sleep in people with insomnia. And we are now going for a, a further continuation study, which maybe I can tell you about next year. At this point, I would like to end and like to thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dieter, for a, a fantastic talk. We've got a few questions that have come in in the chat um, around um, REM sleep and depression. So firstly, um, Sandra Tam has asked, do you have any idea about the effects on REM instability in insomnia patients who are taking antidepressants which suppress REM? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I mean, I, I was around already 30 years ago and there was a lot of interest in the impact of antidepressants and suppression of REM sleep as a conditio sine qua non of antidepressant efficacy was postulated at the time. We now see that there are 
exceptions. Not all antidepressants suppress uh, REM sleep, but, but there's an interesting phenomenon that sedating antidepressants are used for insomnia at very low doses. This has become clinical practice in many countries uh, around uh, the world. And we have done lots of studies with trimipramine. I don't know whether this is available in the UK. This is one of the oldest antidepressants. It does not suppress REM sleep. In the, it, has, it seems to have a smoothening effect on, on REM sleep instability compared to other drugs. The point is, I do not think that antidepressants really in a sustained way suppress REM sleep. You know, we do a lot of clinical work and we see people on antidepressants for years. And you see, for example, venlafaxine, it really suppresses REM sleep by 90%. But in between you have rebound effects, yeah? Uh, even under stable medication. So I think that's an important point. And I think it's a much more um, controlled study. Yeah, I, th I think the field has, you know, after, after the eighties, one has given up this avenue, but I think it's very important to learn what these drugs really do in a long-term way to sleep. Excellent, thank you. There are a few other questions in the chat there, but I see that Jörg is standing by, so I don't want to uh, impact any further on his time. Um, but Dieter, if you're oh, happy to on. answer those. <laughs> are, are you okay, are, um, Jörg, are you okay for me to take another couple of questions? Yeah? Okay. In that case, I have a question from Nicola Barclay, again about REM sleep and depression. But this time asking, do you consider the REM sleep disturbances and depression to be a consequence of comorbid insomnia or the brain's attempt to deal with negative emotions? Oh, that's a very good, important question. We, we speculated that, and, and we, we did a meta-analysis on PSG in insomnia. And actually what we find in chronic insomnia without depression is a slight reduction in REM sleep. Yeah, so usually healthy adults have like 20% of REM sleep, insomniacs had 17 to 18%. And we said probably also this, this ar arousals during REM sleep, this is a kind of very slowly progressing REM sleep deprivation. No. And in the end, if you go through this for years and years and years, suddenly this might lead to a REM sleep rebound, which and the REM sleep rebound looks like REM sleep alterations in depression, short REM latency, increased frequency of eye movements, a very long first REM period. So we, we suggested that maybe this long term slight REM sleep deprivation leads in the end if you turn into, if, if you develop depression, comes along with a REM sleep uh, a rebound effects. And we, we, we guess that this long-term changes in REM sleep, if you experience this for a very long time, it, it's not the only factor for depression. We all know that there are lots of important factors in psychosocial, but it could at least make you more vulnerable to develop depression because I would say your emotional equilibrium is not functioning as well every night than in somebody who, is, who has uh, undisturbed sleep. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much. There are quite a few questions in the chat. So if you're happy to answer those in the yeah. Q&A, that would be great. Um, so thank you very much again for joining us. And we will move on to our final speaker of the session and in fact of the day. And really our final speaker uh, requires no introduction. Dr. Jörg Steyer, as well as organising today's excellent meeting, is currently a consultant physician in the Lane Fault Respiratory Unit and Sleep Disorders Centre at Guy's and St Thomas's. He is also a reader in Sleep and Respiratory Medicine at King's College London, and of course is the current president of the British Sleep Society. And it's in this final capacity that he'll speak to us today, introducing the BSS strategy for healthy sleep for all. So thank you, Jörg. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Lizzie. And uh, first of all, Happy birthday to Freiburg, uh, Dieter. If you're still there, thank you so much for taking time off to talk to us uh, during the World Sleep Day, but also on your birthday. So herzlichen Glückwunsch to Germany and thank you for supporting this symposium. So um, thanks for the invitation to talk and thanks to the chairs, Lizzie and Tim to uh, moderate. Thanks to Michelle to speak. The British Sleep Society strategic plan, what better time to present it than today, 
on World Sleep Day, because this is what it's all about. We want to engage, we want to instill interest in sleep, sleep medicine, and we want to get everyone around the table to talk about it. So let me, in the remaining uh, minutes of this day, talk you through uh, the strategic plan that we propose, that we've now started to promote. And um, I would like to thank particularly uh, Alex Perkins on this occasion from our executive committee who prepared these slides when we were going through the strategy. So can I take uh, the pointer to move forwards, please? Thank you. So when it comes down to a strategy, you've got to think, what are our values? Um, because um, that is obviously essential for a society. Um, only then, when you understand this a bit better, you can develop your vision and your mission to achieve this. Um, we've also uh, here visually nice, um, um, engaged, um, focused on our priorities to achieve all this. So let me take you through this. Our vision is that the BSS aims to be at the heart of a vibrant sleep health community in the UK and as part of the ANSS and the ESRS also in the wider community. And I think today that shows um, how we fit into this picture. Uh, the mission, of course, is that we support excellence in the multidisciplinary practice across the field of sleep medicine. And I think, again, today has given me so much more insight to show that, yes, we do know a lot in our respective field, but we only become really holistic and we can only provide our patients some precision medicine if we think beyond, if we engage beyond our own horizon and engage with other specialties. In my case, I'm a respiratory physician. That means I work with neurologists, with psychiatrists, with psychologists, with the sleep techs, with modern technology, with telemedicine, and with the patient to understand what we can do better. Now, our values are largely around four topics that partially overlap and that all define that we want to achieve ideally healthy sleep for all. Now, that is a goal in times of a worldwide pandemic. Of course, the opposite is currently true, but that's why there is such a big need to uh, work towards these goals. So let me talk you in the coming slides through our plan about values involving innovation and improvement, public and professional engagement, evidence-based practice and transparency and inclusivity. Again, today is a fairly good example to combine all this. And so the slogan, healthy sleep for all, if I would uh, put this on a slogan for World Sleep Day, I probably would do that. So why healthy sleep for all? Understanding and promoting the benefit of healthy sleep for all is at the heart of our activity as clinicians, researchers, and educators. We want to understand what's going on in this state. Um, the wake state is fairly well uh, explored, but only in the new millennium with more long-term follow-up studies with more big data available and more insight into what's happening whilst we asleep, we have actually um, evolved into a position where we would say even a lot of long-term conditions might be finding their cause, their origin in something that's going disastrously wrong whilst we're asleep. Think treatment, hyper, uh, hypertension, treatment resistant hypertension, for example. But also in the world of neurology, um, when we had the last clinical update sleep, that was the hot topic, REM sleep behavior disorder being associated with long-term neurodegenerative conditions. Sometimes precedes this by more than a decade. So we understand this and we understand why healthy sleep for all is so important. 
We want to be innovative. We want to improve. We know we are not perfect. I mentioned it in the context of the poor sleep that the public health currently experiences during times of a pandemic, but we want to get into the position to help ideally many people reach out maybe remotely, maybe with telemedicine. And there were some nice cartoons about this earlier on in Professor Schubel's presentations. Um, so we want to make sure that we set standards, that we are innovative and that we embrace really the future. Because only when we on a large, think on a large scale, we can make a difference to public health. And by thinking beyond this um, moment, we might need to think much more so, in my opinion, about primary prevention. I've heard this in the first session today um, in the context of cardiac conditions, hypertension, and uh, Professor Walter McNicholas again um, stressed this in the keynote lecture. Now, when we think in the world of sleep medicine from a respiratory physician's perspective, how can we favor primary prevention? Well, uh, certainly sleep apnea being associated with obesity um, is something where we may need as a society on a public health scale, uh, educate and get involved. Evidence-based practice. Well, in parallel to this, this session, um, we have actually the hot topics and clinical trial session. So certainly this is the rigorous approach towards evidence-based medicine and randomized control trial data is the best evidence we can produce. Not everything has that level of evidence. And often it comes down to still a discussion between the clinician and the patient, a trusting working relationship to make sensible decisions um, related to the case, but on a large scale, this is what moves the field forward. Transparency and inclusivity. Now, this is important, and we want to thrive by really getting everyone involved. The patients has something to say, be it explaining us about their symptoms. What does it help if we normalize their age or if they still feel terribly sleepy? We want to engage with a diverse community. Um, so you will see this more and more that we hopefully move away. And I hope we didn't make this mistake today um, uh, from something that in the English um, community is worded as manals. So we want to be diverse. We want to be open-minded and we want to hear everyone's thoughts. So we will be transparent as a society, and we will certainly uh, open our thoughts to what is going on in the discussion on the ground with the public, but also in the discussion with our partners on a national scale in other um, uh, specialties and on an international scale, for, for example, with the Assembly of National Societies and the ESRS. So public and professional engagement, what can I say? That is it today. And thank you so much for uh, holding on on a Friday afternoon. We were thrilled to have the interest uh, that we've seen today of everyone getting involved. Um, I'm so sorry that we couldn't meet in person. I look forward to running this again, hopefully in two years time, and then welcoming you all in person. I've missed really the chats uh, on the corridor after a seminar today or after a lecture. And um, I mean, we would now go with Dieter into the next pub after this session. Um, unfortunately, that's not possible. So public and professional engagement is currently on hold in that it's all virtual. So bear with us. We know we're not perfect, but this is our goal. And how do we want to realize this? Um, uh, so in the short amount of time that I still have, we have three main streams. Those of you working in the UK in academia will have heard of the tripartite agenda 
education, clinical practice and research agenda. So these three streams uh, drive forward our society life. Um, what's really the joining, the overarching theme is communication. What I'm doing right now, talking to you, um, we want to uh, send the message out that we are here, your society, to make this work, to engage in public health, to talk to policyholders, and to be there for our patients. So again, we're not perfect, but we're working on this. And we have today academic and research events, clinical practice we've heard about. Um, there is a big overlap. And um, you will see, hopefully, at the BSS conference uh, in November this year, more about each of these streams. And I'm so pleased also to engage more so after last time, the British Pediatric Sleep Society joining this time. Now we have the British Sleep Dental Society for um, uh, joining us as well on these streams. So I've said almost everything about these topics and I will leave it really at that for now. We will want to engage with you. So this is your society, the BSS. We will have the chance to have you determine our agenda for the conference later this year. We will have seats available on our executive committee. Um, uh, we have uh, seats available on the educational and the research subcommittees this year. So if you think you enjoyed today, and if you think you want to make a difference, and if you want to engage and next time see yourself on this camera, then please get in touch. We would like to hear from you. We would like to make this your event. Uh, we know there are so many people who have so brilliant ideas and we can be part of this interface because by coming together, you reach this critical mass and certain topics that are sometimes, maybe for policymakers in the UK, uh, inconvenient to listen to, um, we can give you a voice and uh, certain topics don't go away. And by revisiting them over time, the peer group will succeed in what is best for the patient. I'm convinced about that and I'm so pleased for everyone joining us today. But now I think I've said enough. Um, uh, Lizzie is already uh, on the link. We've got two minutes left before we all come together in the take home message. Thanks for joining. Have a wonderful evening with World Sleep Day. And um, I hope that we will meet each other again at BSS events later this year. Lizzie, are you there? I am here, thank you. Any, any questions that anyone would like to, to pose about anything that's happened in Jörg's talk, anything from uh, the rest of the session, now's the time to, to ask those questions. I don't see anything in the um, outstanding in the Q&A, so I don't know, Jörg, if you um, have anything else you'd like to say or if anyone else on the panel has any questions or comments. I mean, from my side of things, I'd just like to say that if anyone's thinking about um, applying for any of the BSS positions and is maybe thinking, well, that's not for me, that's for other people that have more experience or who are better known than me, then I can absolutely vouch for what a fantastic experience it is to get involved. I had someone else give me a big shove to put myself forward when I started on the committee about 11 years ago, and um, I really have no regrets. So if anyone else needs that little shove, then I'm happy to to give you that. So don't think Lizzie, it's something that other people do. Um, it's something that any of you are, are well qualified to put yourself forward for. Lizzie, on behalf of the society, thank you so much for really being a leader uh, on the educational committee over the last uh, how many years? You said it, 11 years, yeah? Um, Too many. We are so grateful. <laughs> and um, uh, you, you must have seen a big, big step forward. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely.